Well, thank you all for coming tonight. And uh, I am from Atlanta, Georgia, the home of Coca-Cola, CNN, and where two inches of snow can bring an entire city to a standstill. How many of you saw that on the news back in January, right? It was awful. Fortunately, it was a bipartisan kind of a disaster because we have a Republican governor, a Democrat mayor, and they blame each other. And um, we're hoping that doesn't happen again. So um, if we summarize all of the attributes of, of the image, it's this. It's superficial, penetrates only the top two microfibers. There's no directionality, such as with brush strokes. There's no outline to the image. Um, is no cementing of fibers as with paint. It's uniform in intensity, top to bottom, front to back. You'd think you'd need a piece of technology to do that. There's no variations in density as with known artworks. Every artist gets a little bit more there, a little bit less there. There's no evidence of that. There's no particles between the threads, such as some kind of a dust rubbing. There's no capillary action, no, no evidence that, that, any, that any liquids were applied to the image to bring forth or to the image area. There's no paint binder present, nothing to bind any pigment to the cloth. It's a negative image with distance information encoded into it. It's blood from actual wounds. It's AB positive blood with human DNA and there's no image under the, the blood. Now that's interesting. No image under the blood, which tells you this, that the order of events is, is that, is that the blood was on the cloth first, followed by the image. When did the image get there? We don't know. Maybe three days later? I don't know, just later. And so, so, so now that makes sense if it's authentic, right? Good Friday followed by Easter Sunday. But it makes no sense if it's the work of an artist. Now there's been at least a half a dozen attempts by various artists to show how, how some alleged medieval artists could have crafted th this image. You know, most of them are pretty horrible. A couple of them are decent from a distance, but they all break down under the, under the microscope. But they all make the same mistake. They craft their image, and then, they, and then they glibly paint the blood where it's supposed to go. Well, two problems. Number one, it's not painted blood. But number two, wait, 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 wait. The blood was on the cloth first, then the image. Now you do that, and you've accomplished something. So now when you look at this total pattern, here's the, the, the front image on your left, the dorsal image on your right. When you look at this and you, now that you know all the very unique and specific attributes of this cloth and, the, and its image, whether the shroud is authentic or not, this is phenomenal. So, is the shroud just an artwork? If that's the case, who is the artist? How did he do it? Why nothing else to his credit? And why can't we replicate it today? So now we come to this question. Well, what caused the image? Is it the work of an artist? Doesn't seem real likely to me. Is it a custom crucifixion? Did someone deliberately crucify someone during the Middle Ages to emulate or replicate what happened to Jesus? <laughs> Maybe, I suppose. But here's the problem, is that as far as we know, corpses don't make images on linen shrouds. We've examined hundreds of linen shrouds and none of them have an image on it, just smudges of decomposition. Well, what about resurrection then? I mean, because after all, doesn't, doesn't the scripture talk about Jesus rising from the dead on the, on the third day? So it stands the reason that maybe we should explore that for a minute. You know, it's interesting if, you know, if, the, if, if you were to ask this question, there, there, there were no eyewitnesses to the resurrection. Now, there were, there were at least a half a dozen post-resurrection appearances where Jesus appeared to somebody after he rose from the dead, but there were no eyewitnesses to the resurrection event itself. So if you're going to ask the question of what happened to Jesus in the tomb, you're going to have to do it by inference, by looking at other verses of Scripture. Now here's one right from Matthew. It says, The angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. And the angel appearing like lightning. 
Now, there's another incident that, that occurred before Jesus was ever crucified. Days, weeks, it's called the Mount of Transfiguration. And now Peter, James, and John are down at the bottom of this hill. Jesus goes up to the top of a hill, and the scripture says this, And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became white as light. So Jesus transformed into a being of light. This is before the crucifixion. And then the conversion of Saul who becomes Paul. This is about four years after the crucifixion. Listen to this. He says, Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. The scripture goes on and tells you he was blinded for three days after this event. So just piece it together. I mean, Forget the shroud for a minute, just a straight Bible study. If you were to ask the question of what happened to Jesus, the very split second that his soul came zooming back into that lifeless body, I think you'd have to assume that there was an explosion of light and then gone. And that's my view. Now, interestingly, as an article came out in Biblical Archaeological Review of 1985, and they said this, the shroud is a fake because the fingers are too long. Okay, great. So now we have a medieval artist who gets everything right except the fingers. Really? Well, maybe we're not looking at fingers. Now, I have my only prop back here. I'm going to get it. This is a skeletal hand. Okay? If I were to overlay my hand against this, you'll see that half of this is in the palm of your hand, right? Which is exactly why, remember we talked about earlier, how a nail going through the palm of the hand will not hold the weight of a crucified man? Now, now you see, right? And so this then, now so what, what we're seeing on the shroud with these very long fingers appears to be the combination of flesh and bone simultaneously. This is a clue because you see, because direct, I'm going to put this down, direct contact with the body only explains the blood. It does not explain the image. This distance information, the image is on the cloth where it would not have even been in direct contact with the body. So we're looking at a different process. And so many researchers have been, have been working on theories related to heat, light, radiation, some kind of radiant energy mechanism. Now, personally, I'm in for light. Now, why light? Because light would be perfectly consistent with Scripture. Everything I know about the Shroud perfectly correlates with Scripture. So that being the case, I think we should be looking for light. Now, in this energy mechanism, whatever it is, we even see the large hollow orbits of the eyes correspond with the orbits of a skull. And some people that are good at image analysis can even see the roots of the teeth. Now, let's get back to light. Now, what's interesting is this. We've been trying to replicate aspects of the shroud image using light for years. Haven't been able to do it. Until 2011, researchers with the ENEA, this is a European research agency, uh, some researchers were experimenting with, uh, with ultraviolet eczema lasers. And, use, and they determined that a 40 nanosecond burst on a UV laser against a control sample of linen achieves the same depth, remember, one to two microns in depth, and the same coloration that we see on the shroud. Now, this is intriguing. Now, why do I say that? Because probably the best single explanation for what happened to Jesus in the tomb comes from the Apostle Paul, who writes in 1 Corinthians 15. And in this scripture that I'm about to read you, he's not even talking about Jesus. He's talking about you and he's talking about me. And listen to what he says. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. How? In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. 
Paul is talking about a future event. Hasn't happened yet, but this is exactly what happened to Jesus in the tomb. But wait a minute, in a flash? Maybe a 40 nanosecond flash? I mean, that's kind of cool, isn't it? I mean, so now why do I know that this is exactly what happened to Jesus? Because Jesus is described as the first fruits of the resurrection. So if he's the first fruit, we are the rest of the fruit. If he's the first fruit of the harvest, we are the rest of the harvest that comes later. So believe it or not, whatever happened to Jesus in the tomb is what's going to happen to us at some point in the future. I don't know when it's going to happen. I just know it is. Now, what's the nature of the post-resurrection body? On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. He didn't knock on the door. He didn't climb in the window. He just appeared. <clears throat> now, the scripture is telling you that they had the doors locked. The windows were shut. They were freaked out. And Jesus just appears. And the scripture goes on and tells you that they, that they came up to him and they handled him. They talked. They ate together. And... He talked about the kingdom for hours. Now, Thomas was not there. We don't know where Thomas was, but he wasn't there. And so eventually Jesus leaves the same way he came. Later that night, maybe the next day, Thomas finally shows up. Now, can you imagine the scene? Every one of these, you now they're the apostles and the rest of the followers are all up there in the upper room. They all come up to Thomas saying, Thomas, where were you? It's true. He is alive. He has risen from the dead. It was amazing. We touched him. We ate together. And he talked about the kingdom. And, you know, where were you? And Jesus, Thomas probably doesn't answer. He says, no, no, I, ref I will not believe. I refuse to believe, crosses his arms, classic defensive style, right? And he says, not until I thrust my, my hand into his side and place my fingers into his nail wounds. Those were his words. Now, this goes on for a whole week. And finally, Jesus appears again in the upper room. This time, Thomas is there. And the first person Jesus speaks to is Thomas. And he uses Thomas's own words. He says, Thomas, thrust your hand into my side. Place your fingers into my nail wounds and, and be not faithless, but believe. Now at this point, as he's always been, as he, for 2,000 years, he's been called Doubting Thomas. And, from, and now this man now makes the strongest profession of faith in the entire New Testament. He says, my Lord and my God. But he couldn't do it until he was face to face with the resurrected Christ for himself. Now, I think that's the message of the shroud. You see, for years I've wondered why God has preserved the shroud. Why has it been revealed through science throughout the course of the 20th century? And literally, and now in the 21st century, we communicate today more with images than we do with words. And maybe the shroud has been preserved for this time in human history. I don't know if the shroud is authentic. I think it is. I think it probably is. Can't get my head about it being the work of some artist. But you know what? But here's what I do know. Is that the message of the shroud is identical to scripture. There is no difference. So I have to ask this question then. What then is the message of the shroud? And the message of the shroud is past, present, and future. It's past because it takes us back to a historical event. That event is called the resurrection. Now, there are millions of people in the world that will ask, they will say, why do I have to believe that Jesus rose again from the dead in some supernatural resurrection? Why can't I just believe that he was a good man who did good things? And I submit to you that you can believe anything you want. But if that's all you believe, it's not enough. Now, why do I say it's not enough? Because if Jesus is not risen, he's dead. And a dead Jesus can offer you or me nothing. Only a Jesus who has risen from the dead, only a Jesus who has defeated the power of death, only that Jesus has the right, the authority, and the ability to offer you or me anything beyond this life. So you have to start with the resurrection as a historical event. 
But then the resurrection, but then the message of the shot is also future. And we talked about this in 1 Corinthians 15, right? Behold, I show you a mystery. We'll not all sleep. We'll all be changed in a moment, in a flash. That's in the future. And so to me, the shroud is literally a snapshot, a picture of a future event. And your, and your Baptist friends may call it the rapture. I don't care what you call it. It's a future event. So, but the, but the most important message is the present. Because you see, we see the, the shroud in the now. We see it now. In the present and in the present, whether you're looking at the real deal or looking at photography or looking at something on the Internet, you see the price that was paid. Now, that's an interesting phrase, the price that was paid. There are four words that are used to describe the shroud most commonly. They'll call it a relic, an artifact, a mystery, a symbol. Now, these words describe what the shroud is as an object, but they, but they don't describe the purpose or the function of the shroud. So I want to introduce a whole new concept. And to do this, I need to, have, I need to introduce four more words. And these words are all from Scripture. The first word is bought. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Second word, purchased. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock which he purchased with his own blood. The third word, redeemed. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. And then the fourth word is a word Jesus used, and that's ransom. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So what do these four words mean? Bought, purchased, redeemed, ransomed. These are all words of transaction. A transaction has occurred. A payment has been made on our behalf. Now, when you go to a store and you make a purchase, you know, you're making a transaction. Now, when you give the money, when you buy anything at the store, what does the cashier always give you in return? A receipt, right? Exactly. There it is. A receipt. And what is a receipt? It's a what? It's a proof of purchase, right? So when Peter and John ran to the tomb and saw the linen cloth lying there, what did they see? They saw the proof of purchase. They saw the receipt. I think the Shroud of Turin is a receipt. Not only that, it's an itemized receipt documenting everything that was paid. Crown of thorns, wound in the side, severe scourging, nail wounds in the wrist, nail wounds in the feet. It's a proof of purchase. We have been purchased, we belong to Christ, and we have a receipt to prove it. And you know what? It's as if, it's as if this receipt is stamped and says, paid in full. And do you know that the words in Greek, paid in full, is the exact same words where Jesus is on the cross and he says, it is finished. Same thing. But I got to take this concept one step further. And that's this. We know from Scripture that salvation is a free gift. This is the most well-known verse in Scripture. You see it behind home plate with the guy holding up the big orange sign that says John 3.16, right? It says, For God so loved the world that, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life, right? And then, of course, in Romans 6.23, it says, that, But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, what do we know? That salvation is a free gift, right? So let's put it all together. Jesus met the terms of the ransom. That's his word. What was the term? His own life. Not just any life. The life of the, of the one and only Son of God. He purchased salvation for us and then gives it back to us as a free gift. Now, and then he says this. If anyone questions this gift I'm giving you this day, here's a receipt. Now, the interesting thing about a gift is this. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. All you can do is receive it. Well, maybe not all. 
I suppose you could reject it, right? Well, I really appreciate your offer of everlasting life, but I'm just not interested. <laughs> right? Or you, could re or you could be real ambivalent about it. Well, let me, let me, let me, now let me get this straight. So you have everlasting life and everlasting death. Can I think about this? Really? You really need to think about this. So you see, the only logical, rational thing to do is just receive it. And isn't it interesting that that's the exact same word that the Gospel of John uses, very first chapter, says this, He came unto his own, but his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the sons of God to those who believe on his name. Now, for you ladies, that sons has nothing to do with gender. It has to do with position. You're either a son or a servant. As a son, you are a full heir to the kingdom. As a servant, you have no claim to the kingdom. So this, this sonship thing is a big thing. And um, so it, sons, you, modern translation is trying to say there's children of God. But the original says sons. The, now, what's interesting is this. The shroud is not the gift. Jesus is the gift. God the Father is the giver of the gift. The shroud merely is a receipt that validates that in fact this gift was given. No one worships a receipt, right? Because I have a lot of my evangelical friends that say, well, you know, the shroud, people are going to worship that. Why would you worship a receipt? Jesus is the gift. We worship the gift and the giver of the gift. The receipt simply documents the incredible price that was paid. Now, one final thought. If someone bought you the most amazing gift imaginable, and then gave you the receipt to go along with it, to validate that this now belongs to you, what would you do with the receipt? Would you throw it away? No, you probably, I would hope not. You'd probably put it in a, it'd probably be put it in a safety deposit box or something, wouldn't you? And then every once in a while, you'll look at that receipt to remind yourself of the awesome price that was paid. And you see, that's exactly what happens with the shroud is that, is that it's kept in a sealed box and every once in a while it's brought out for public viewing for the entire world to see the price that was paid. So I have one question for you. Have you received your free gift yet? If not, what are you waiting for? Thank you very much and God bless.